The Red Badge of Courage, an episode of the American Civil War by Stephen Crane, Chapter 3. When another night came, the columns changed to purple streaks, filed across two pontoon bridges. A glaring fire wine-tinted the waters of the river, its rays shining upon moving masses of troops brought forth here and there sudden gleams of silver or gold. Upon the other shore, a dark and mysterious range of hills was curved against the sky. The insect voices of the night sang solemnly. After this crossing, the youth assured himself that at any moment they might be suddenly and fearfully assaulted from the caves of the lowering woods. He kept his eyes watchfully upon the darkness. But his regiment went unmolested to a camping place, and the soldiers slept the brave sleep of wearied men. In the morning they were routed out with early energy, and hustled along a narrow road that led deep into the forest. It was during this rapid march that the regiment lost many of the marks of a new command. The men had begun to count the miles upon their fingers, and they grew tired. "'Sore feet and damn short rations, that's all,' said the loud soldier. There was perspiration and grumblings. After a time they began to shed their knapsacks. Some tossed them unconcernedly down, others hid them carefully, asserting their plans to return for them at some convenient time. Men extricated themselves from thick shirts. Presently a few carried anything but their necessary clothing, blankets, haversacks, canteens, and arms and ammunition. "'You can now eat and shoot,' said the tall soldier to the youth. "'That's all you want to do.' There was a sudden change from the ponderous infantry of theory to the light and speedy infantry of practice. The regiment, relieved of a burden, received a new impetus. But there was much loss of valuable knapsacks and, on the whole, very good shirts. But the regiment was not yet veteran-like in appearance. Veteran regiments in the army were likely to be very small aggregations of men. Once, when the command had first come to the field, some perambulating veterans, noting the length of their columns, had accosted them thus. "'Hey, fellers, what brigade is that?' And when the men had replied that they formed a regiment, and not a brigade, the older soldiers had laughed and said, "'Oh, God!' Also, there was too great a similarity in hats. The hats of a regiment should properly represent the history of headgear for a period of years, and moreover, there were no letters of faded gold speaking from the colors. They were new and beautiful, and the color-bearer habitually oiled the pole. Presently the army sat down to think. The odor of the peaceful pines was in the men's nostrils. The sound of monotonous axe blows rang through the forest, and insects, nodding on their perches, crooned like old women. The youth returned to his theory of a blue demonstration. One gray dawn, however, he was kicked in the leg by the tall soldier, and then, before he was entirely awake, he found himself running down a wood road, in the midst of men who were panting from the first effects of speed. His canteen banged rhythmically upon his thigh. His musket bounced a trifle from his shoulder at each stride, and made his cap feel uncertain upon his head. He could hear the men whisper jerky sentences. "'Say, what's this all about? What the thunder we skedaddling this way for? Billy, keep off my feet!' "'Yeah, run like a cow!' And the loud soldier's shrill voice could be heard. "'What the devil they in such a hurry for?' The youth thought the damp fog of early morning moved from the rush of a great body of troops. From the distance came a sudden spatter of firing. He was bewildered. As he ran with his comrades, he strenuously tried to think. But all he knew was that if he fell down, those coming behind would tread upon him. All his faculties seemed to be needed to guide him over and past obstructions. He felt carried along by a mob. The sun spread, disclosing rays, and one by one regiments burst into view like armed men just born of the earth. The youth perceived that the time had come. He was about to be measured. For a moment he felt in the face of his great trial like a babe, and the flesh over his heart seemed very thin. He seized time to look about him calculatingly but he instantly saw that it would be impossible for him to escape from the regiment. It enclosed him, and there were iron laws of tradition and laws on four sides. He was in a moving box. As he perceived this fact, it occurred to him 
that he had never wished to come to war. He had not enlisted of his free will. He had been dragged by the merciless government, and now they were taking him out to be slaughtered. The regiment slid down a bank and wallowed across a little stream. The mournful current moved slowly on, and from the water, shaded black, some white bubble eyes looked at the men. As they climbed the hill on the further side, artillery began to boom. Here the youth forgot many things as he felt a sudden impulse of curiosity. He scrambled up the bank with a speed that could not be exceeded by a bloodthirsty man. He expected a battle scene. There were some little fields girded and squeezed by a forest. Spread over the grass and in among the tree trunks, he could see knots and waving lines of skirmishers who were running hither and thither and firing at the landscape. A dark battle line lay upon a sunstruck clearing that gleamed orange color. A flag fluttered. Other regiments floundered up the bank. The brigade was formed in line of battle, and after a pause started slowly through the woods in the rear of the receding skirmishers, who were continually melting into the scene to appear again further on. They were always busy as bees, deeply absorbed in their little combats. The youth tried to observe everything. He did not use care to avoid trees and branches, and his forgotten feet were constantly knocking against stones or getting entangled in briars. He was aware that these battalions, with their commotions, were woven red and startling into the gentle fabric of softened greens and browns. It looked to be a wrong place for a battlefield. The skirmishers in advance fascinated him. Their shots into thickets and at distant and prominent trees spoke to him of tragedies, hidden, mysterious, solemn. Once the line encountered the body of a dead soldier. He lay upon his back, staring at the sky. He was dressed in an awkward suit of yellowish-brown. The youth could see that the soles of his shoes had been worn to the thinness of writing paper, and from the rent in one a dead foot projected piteously, and it was as if fate had betrayed the soldier. In death it exposed to his enemies the poverty in which in life he had perhaps concealed from his friends. The ranks opened covertly to avoid the corpse, the invulnerable dead man forced away for himself. The youth looked keenly at the ashen face. The wind raised the tawny beard. It moved as if a hand were stroking it. He vaguely desired to walk around and around the body and stare, the impulse of the living to try to read in dead eyes the answer to the question. During the march, the ador which the youth had acquired when out of view of the field rapidly faded to nothing. His curiosity was quite easily satisfied. If an intense scene had caught him with its wild swing as he came to the top of the bank, he might have gone roaring on. This advance upon nature was too calm. He had opportunity to reflect. He had time in which to wonder about himself and to attempt to probe the sensations. Absurd ideas took hold upon him. He thought that he did not relish the landscape. It threatened him. A coldness swept over his back, and it is true that his trousers felt to him that they were no fit for his legs at all. A house standing placidly in distant fields had to him an ominous look. The shadows of the woods were formidable. He was certain that in the vista there lurked fierce-eyed hosts. The swift thought came to him that the generals did not know what they were about. It was all a trap. Suddenly those close forests would bristle with rifle barrels. Iron-like brigades would appear in the rear. They were all going to be sacrificed. The generals were stupids. The enemy would presently swallow the whole command. He glared about him, expecting to see the stealthy approach of his death. He thought that he must break from the ranks and harangue his comrades. They must not all be killed like pigs, and he was sure it would come to pass unless they were informed of these dangers. The generals were idiots to send them marching into a regular pen. There was but one pair of eyes in the corps. He would step forth and make a speech. Shrill and passionate words came to his lips. The line broken into moving fragments by the ground went calmly on through the fields and woods. The youth looked at the men nearest him and saw, for the most part, expressions of deep interest, as if they were investigating something that had fascinated them. One or two stepped with overvaliant airs, as if they were already plunged into war. Others walked as upon thin ice. The greater part of the untested men appeared quiet and absorbed. 
They were going to look at war, the red animal, war, the blood-swollen god, and they were deeply engrossed in this march. As he looked, the youth gripped his outcry at his throat. He saw that even if the men were tottering with fear, they would laugh at his warning. They would jeer him, if practicable, pelt him with missiles. Admitting that he might be wrong, a frenzied declamation of the kind would turn him into a worm. He assumed then the demeanor of one who knows that he is doomed alone to unwritten responsibilities. He lagged with tragic glances at the sky. He was surprised presently by the young lieutenant of his company, who began heartily to beat him with a sword, calling out in a loud and insolent voice, "'Come, young man, get up to the ranks. No sulking'll do here.' He mended his pace with suitable haste, and he hated the lieutenant, who had no appreciation of fine minds. He was a mere brute. After a time the brigade was halted in the cathedral light of a forest. The bushy skirmishers were still popping. Through the aisles of the wood could be seen of the floating smoke from the rifles. Sometimes it went up in little balls, white and compact. During this halt, many men in the regiment began erecting tiny hills in front of them. They used stone, sticks, earth, and anything they thought might turn a bullet. Some built comparatively large ones, while others seemed content with little ones. This procedure caused a discussion among the men. Some wished to fight like duelists, believing it to be correct to stand erect and be, from their feet to their foreheads, a mark. They said they scorned the devices of the cautious. But the others scoffed in reply and pointed to the veterans on the flanks who were digging at the ground like terriers. In a short time there was quite a barricade along the regimental fronts. Directly, however, they were ordered to withdraw from that place. This astounded the youth. He forgot his stewing over the advance movement. "'Well, then, what did they march us out here for?' he demanded of the tall soldier. The latter, with calm faith, began a heavy explanation, although he had been compelled to leave a little protection of stones and dirt, to which he had devoted much care and skill. When the regiment was aligned in another position, each man's regard for his safety caused another line of small entrenchments. They ate their noon meal behind a third one. They were moved from this one also. They were marched from place to place with apparent aimlessness. The youth had been taught that a man became another thing in battle. He saw his salvation in such a change. Hence, his waiting was an ordeal to him. He was in a fervor of impatience. He considered that there was denoted a lack of purpose on the part of the generals. He began to complain to the tall soldiers. "'I can't stand this much longer,' he cried. "'I don't see what good it does to make us wear out our legs for nothing.' He wished to return to camp, knowing that this affair was a blue demonstration, or else to go into battle and discover that he had been a fool in his doubts, and was, in truth, a man of traditional courage.' The strain of present circumstances he felt to be intolerable. The philosophical tall soldier measured a sandwich of cracker and pork and swallowed it in a nonchalant manner. Oh, I suppose I must go reconnoitering around the country just to keep em from getting too close or develop em or something. Huh? said the loud soldier. Well, cried the youth, still fidgeting. I'd rather do anything, most than go tramping around the country, all day, doing no good to nobody, and just tiring ourselves out. So would I, said the loud soldier. It ain't right, I tell you, if anybody with a sense was a run in this army, it— Oh, shut up, roared the tall private. You little fool, you damn little cuss. You ain't had that there coat or them pants on for six months, and yet you talk as if— Well, I'm going to do some fighting anyway interrupted the other. I didn't come here to walk. Could have walked to home, round and around the barn, if I just wanted to walk. The tall one, red face, swallowed another sandwich, as if taking poison in despair. But gradually, as he chewed, his face became again quiet and contented. He could not rage in fierce argument in the presence of such sandwiches. During his meal, he always wore an air of blissful contemplation of the food he had swallowed. His spirit, then, seemed to be communing with the viands. He accepted new environment and circumstances with great coolness, eating from his haversack at every opportunity. On the march he went along with the strife of a hunter, objecting to neither gait nor distance, and he had not raised his voice when he had been ordered away from three little protective piles of earth and stone, each of which had been an engineering feat worthy of being made sacred to the name of his grandmother. 
In the afternoon the regiment went out over the same ground it had taken in the morning. The landscape then ceased to threaten the youth. He had been close to it and had become familiar with it. When, however, they began to pass into a new region, his old fears of stupidity and incompetence reassailed him. But this time he doggedly let them babble. He was occupied with his problem, and in his desperation he concluded that the stupidity did not greatly matter. Once he thought he had concluded that it would be better to get killed directly and end his troubles. Regarding death thus out of the corner of his eye, he conceived it to be nothing but rest, and he was filled with a momentarily astonishment that he should have made an extraordinary commotion over the mere matter of getting killed. He would die. He would go to some place where he would be understood. It was useless to expect appreciation of his profound and fine senses from such men as the lieutenant. He must look to the grave for comprehension. The skirmish fire increased to a long clatter of sound. With it was mingled a faraway cheering. A battery spoke. Directly the youth would see the skirmishers running. They were pursued by the sound of musketry fire. After a time the hot, dangerous flashes of the rifles were visible. Smoke clouds went slowly and insolently across the fields like observant phantoms. The din became crescendo, like the roar of an oncoming train. A brigade ahead of them and on the right went into action with a rendering roar. It was as if they had exploded, and thereafter it lay stretched in the distance beyond a long gray wall that one was obliged to look twice at, to make sure it was smoke. The youth, forgetting his neat plan of getting killed, gazed spellbound. His eyes grew wide and busy with the action of the scene. His mouth was a little ways open. Of a sudden he felt a heavy and sad hand laid upon his shoulder. Awakening from his trance of observation, he turned to behold the loud soldier. "'It's my first and last battle, old boy,' said the latter, with intense gloom. He was quite pale, and his girlish lip was trembling. And murmured the youth in great astonishment. "'It's my first and last battle, old boy,' continued the loud soldier. "'Something tells me what. "'I'm a gone coon this first time, "'and I want you to take these here things to my folks.' "'He ended in a quavering sob of pity for himself. "'He handed the youth a little packet, "'done up in a yellow envelope. "'Why, what the devil?' began the youth again. "'But the other gave him a glance as from the depths of a tomb "'and raised his limp hand in a prophetic manner and turned away. End of chapter 3